and welcome back to CSI Coatesville. We're looking at microscopy today. How are microscopes used in the forensic lab? Now, going back into history, August 23, 1927, two anarchists, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, die in electric chairs for the murders of two men during an armed robbery of a shoe factory in South Braintree, Massachusetts. What role did the microscope play in the conviction of these two men? On August 23, 1977, 50 years later, Governor Dukakis, also presidential hopeful Michael Dukakis, proclaimed a Memorial Day on this date, seeking to clear the reputations of these two men, believing their unpopular political views had unfairly prejudiced the court against them. Well, we'll come back to this. In today's program, we're going to look at the parts of the optical microscope. We're going to look at viewing with an optical microscope as well as microscope measurement. Now, you've probably seen and used optical microscopes. It may be helpful for you to pause the program at this point and make uh, a note of each of the names of the parts of the microscopes that you see here. While I move on, there are basically three sets of controls that we use with an optical microscope. First, those that focus on the specimen, and we can see that we have a coarse focus and a fine focus knob. We'll come back to those in a moment. And they aid with the resolution of the image that we view. We're also looking at objective lenses, and these are they which determine the magnification of what we actually see through the eyepiece. There's a magnification power to the lens here, and also to the objective lens. Again, we'll come back to those in a moment. But there's also a third set of adjustments that are made. Underneath the stage is a device known as an aperture. Depending upon the model of microscope, you can have a lever here or a disc with holes in it that controls the amount of light that passes through the specimen. Keep in mind it's not always true that more light is going to give you a clearer image. Sometimes we may need to dial back that light so we don't lose the subtle detail that we find in certain structures of specimens. So what we're saying is when we adjust the objective lens and change the magnification, we're going to also go back and adjust the amount of light using the aperture. Let's take a look at what we mean. Here we have the initial setup. Almost any time that you're working with a microscope, you're going to follow the same basic procedure here. First, we're going to secure the specimen to the stage using these stage clips that you see so the specimen remains stationary while we're viewing it. Second, we're going to use the lowest power objective, what we typically refer to as the scanning objective, because it's going to allow us to see the largest area. And that way we can find specimens or parts of specimens that are of particular interest to us. As we do that, we're going to use the coarse focus only. Now, once we get it adjusted and in focus, at low power, we probably will not need to go back and adjust the course focus again, even if we're moving to a higher magnification. And then keep in mind, we need to adjust the aperture to make sure we have the right amount of light that's appropriate for viewing. Again, if you have too much light, it may be irritating or uncomfortable. And again, you may be blasting through very subtle structures that are in your specimen that you may not even see because there's too much light going through them. Now, as we move to a higher power, I'll assume that what we've just spoken about has already been done. And we're going to center that object of interest that we have. A couple years ago, I took a picture with my, uh, my cell phone using a microscope, and we're looking at right here a cat's hair. And if we want to focus on the scales, the scaly features on the cuticle of this cat hair, I'm going to need to move the whole slide down so that that structure is 
right in the center of my field of view at the end of this needle before I move to a higher power. If I fail to do that, I'm not, I may not see that cat hair at all. I may just see uh, empty white space. And then I can go ahead and change to that higher power I have an interest in. And once I've done that, I'm going to use the fine focus that you see. It's always the smaller knob uh, to increase the image clarity. I may have to dial that up and down a little bit until I'm convinced that the the right, about, the right amount of clarity and resolution. And then again, if, if there's not enough light, I've gone from an aperture setting that was probably smaller, and now I'm gathering less light with a higher power objective. It's focusing in on a smaller area, so I'm gathering less light. I'm probably going to need to open the aperture up to allow more light in. Keep that in mind. Now, we want to move on to the topic of microscope measurement. Eventually, when we look at something under the microscope, we're going to ask ourselves, well, really, how big is that? Keep in mind, with an optical microscope, we're dealing with two sets of lenses in combination. So before we can answer that question, really, how big is it, we need to look at what my magnification power is. So at the top of the microscope, closest to the eye, we have the ocular lens power. We're going to multiply that times the objective lens power. If I'm looking at something under uh, an objective lens that's 40 power and I have a 10 power ocular lens, the product of those is 400 times. So I'm looking at an image 400 times larger than what the actual specimen is. Now, to answer the question, how large is it? Another factor that we need to take into account is my actual field of view. How far across am I viewing? Exactly what is the distance from one end of my field of view to the other? Now, on some microscopes, they have a reticle right in the ocular lens, just like you'd be looking down a, a, a gun scope, where you have striations and measurements, a scale that's laid out in the ocular lens. In many cases, you don't have those, so what we need to do, which would not surprise you, we have to take a known standard of measurement, such as a ruler, and make a comparison with that. So we're going to lay across a clear metric ruler, and you're going to do this in the lab, across the stage, and we're going to view this under low power. So here we have a 40x magnification, and we can see that we have one millimeter distance from here to here. We have two, three, four millimeters, but we're just short of five, so we're going to need to estimate that distance. Our field of view looks like it's going to be somewhere around 4.8 millimeters. Now, in most cases, we're going to be looking at objects that are much smaller than a millimeter. Keep in mind, however, that we're probably going to be using micrometers as a measurement of what we see under a microscope, more than millimeters, because then we can drill down to a much smaller um, order of magnitude. The abbreviation for a micrometer is, it looks like a backwards Y, it's actually the Greek letter mu, like the sound that a cat makes, mu. If we have, as I mentioned a moment ago, 4.8 millimeters. And again, I'm estimating this. And using dimensional analysis, I have a thousand micrometers for every one millimeter. I'll divide those out, and I'm left with 4.8 times 1,000 micrometers, 4,800. Sounds like a large number. Keep in mind, these are really small. They're actually a millionth of a meter. Now, let's make this practical. Here we have an image that was taken at 100 power, and so it's much smaller in area. We can barely see the marks that are on our metric ruler. What do we do then? It looks like it might be a distance of one, maybe two millimeters. 
But is it really? Okay. How is that measurement going to be made when the ruler can't be viewed? What if I go to a thousand power using an oil immersion lens? How am I going to make any type of measurement by comparing that with a ruler? There's no way that we would see the marks that are on the ruler. So what will we need to do here? Well, there's a convenient formula that I'll ask you to write down now. If, if you need to pause the program, please do that. Where I can relate the magnification of what I'm looking at with the field of view that I've looked at previously. Keep in mind, we just calculated that we have a low power field of view of 4800 micrometers. We have an unknown high power field of view of X. We're guessing it's around 2 millimeters. We want to confirm that. That's going to be equal to the ratio of the low power magnification, which we said is 40, divided by the high power magnification, which you can see in the background is 100. So we'll reduce these and solve for x by cross multiplying and dividing. Again, we'll bring up our calculator here. 4800 times 4 divided by 10. And I'm getting a value of x, as you can see, of 1920. So x is going to be equal to 1920 micrometers. Now we guessed 2 millimeters, so we're a little bit underneath that right now. Keep in mind, 2 millimeters would be 2,000 micrometers. Now, let's keep that in mind. When you find a field of view diameter for the microscope they're using in the lab, you want to write that down in your notes because you can make use of that later on. In fact, throughout the year. Now consider the following. What are the three groups of microscope controls that you learned about in this program? And what does each do? Did you take notes on this? And again, put yourself in this situation. You try to focus on an object under high power and you can't find it anywhere. What would you do? Think about it. And then imagine this. A microscope lens has a 100 power oil immersion objective lens and a 10x ocular lens, what would be the final magnification of a microscope with these settings? And then to apply all this, let's imagine that a wolf allegedly killed a sheep on a person's farm. Keep in mind, wolves are endangered species in most states in the United States. And a wolf's hair was apparently found on a, a dead sheep that was on um, a sheep herder's farm. Under 400x, seven of these hairs was estimated to be able to fit side by side in the field of view under that magnification. What would the diameter of the hair be in that case? This could be critical because that sheep herder could possibly be compensated for the loss of the sheep if it was killed by an endangered species. And then finally, back to the top of our program, forensic expert Calvin Goddard examined the shell casings and bullets and barrels of Sacco's Colt pistol that you see pictured here, providing convincing proof of its use in the crime. The famous third bullet uh, was actually what convicted him of being involved in these two murders. Goddard used Philip Gravel's new and newly invented comparison microscope that you see pictured here, where the crime scene bullet was placed under one microscope, and it can be viewed side by side with an exemplar that was shot from this gun in the lab, and we can compare the scratches that are on the side of each of these casings and bullets side by side and take a picture of it. Now, in spite of the confirming re-examinations of the ballistic evidence that was done in 1961, and then again in 1983 with more advanced equipment, and these examinations confirmed what Goddard originally found um, on these shell casings, yet due to the fact that 
The chain of custody was not carefully maintained in these cases. In fact, parts of the gun that were used in this crime were actually taken apart and removed from the courthouse by one of the attorneys. This case is still now open even to this day, and yet these two men were executed back in 1927. In fact, Goddard, two years later in 1929, was the investigator that examined the bullets that were found at this other famous crime that you see here, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre between the Irish Northside Gang and Al Capone's gang in Chicago, Illinois, killing seven men of those gangs. Well, that's all the time that we have for now. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.